Good morning to Rivers Church. I'm so thankful for all of you that braved through the snow this morning to be here. Happy New Year. If you're not standing on your feet already, I'm going to ask you to. Come on, put our hands together as we praise the Lord. I praise in the valley. ready to keep praising God? Praise be a weapon that 
everybody. It's so good to be with you. My name is Will. I'm the lead pastor here. And I want to take a second. I want to look right in the camera. I want you to look right at me. I want you to hear this, that I love you. I care about you. I've been praying for you. I'm believing God's best for you this year. We want to welcome all of our locations. Everybody join us in Binghamton, Cortland, Corning, and Montrose. And then everybody join us online and all our extension sites. Church, can we put our hands together, make them feel welcome, make them feel loved. So good to be able to be with you. And we are in this year, been challenging people to, to live this thing, walk it out, give this a year of your life. If you've kind of come and we've seen a whole bunch of people give their lives to Jesus over the Christmas season and, and now in the beginning of the year, and we just want to encourage you every week, be in church, give this every single week your best. And I, I tell people live a God first life. So one of the things we're doing as a church is we're walking through scriptures together. In fact, they're going to have the QR code on the screen and actually you could just download the YouVersion Bible app and, and kind of follow along with us as a church. But this week we were in Exodus chapters 35 through 40 and then Leviticus chapters 1 through 18. I know you guys all were waiting for when we could get to the book of Leviticus. You're so excited. Like, yes, I can finally figure out how to do the right sacrifice for the type of sin that I did or how to bring a fellowship offering. I know there was a lot of curiosity about that. And now you're getting all those answers. And, and it's a beautiful thing to be able to walk through scripture together. Well, I'm joking a little bit about that because I pretty much dislike reading the book of Leviticus every time I get there. But we're going to talk about it today. And, and the title of today's message is, What Makes You Different? Turn to your neighbor and ask him, what makes you different? What makes you different? Well, Barna Research from 2019 regarding millennials, the millennials are now overtaking baby boomers as our country's largest or biggest population or biggest generation Millennials are sort of that 20 to 30 year old range. It's 40, and in, in, in this study, 47% of practicing Christian millennials believe that it's wrong to evangelize someone who isn't a Christian with the goal of converting them to the Christian faith. In fact, these millennials are more than twice as likely as their parents and grandparents to say that it's wrong to share one's personal beliefs with someone of a different faith, in the hopes that they'll one day share the same faith. At the same time, almost all practicing Christian millennials, 96%, said witnessing for Jesus is an important part of being a Christian. Which makes me wonder, what in the world are we thinking? But millennials are higher than any other generation group, 70 3% in saying they know how to respond when someone raises questions about their faith and if they're gifted in sharing their faith with other people. They feel like they're equipped. Gen X is 66%, boomers are 59 and elders are 56%. So millennials are more savvy and confident in navigating the nuances of culture in sharing their faith. Despite being it's like despite seeing a witness as important and having that cultural savvy, almost half, 47%, agree that it's wrong to share one's personal beliefs with someone of a different faith in the hopes that they'll one day share the same faith. So my question for everyone here is: do you think it's wrong to share your faith? Do you think it's wrong to witness? What we would say, I grew up saying this word, hey, I'm going to be a witness for Jesus. So I want to start here. I want to start with what does being a witness mean? What does being a witness mean? Well, at the end of Jesus' ministry, he's getting ready. He's gone to the cross. He's died, and now he's risen again. He's giving his disciples some final instructions. And he says to them, hey, I, he gives them what's called the Great Commission. I want you to go into all the world, and I want you to make disciples of every nation. Somebody turn to your neighbor and tell them every nation. 
that word there is actually ethnos. It means people group. It means every type of person that you can possibly imagine. It's not talking about uh, borders and geography. It's talking about different types of cultures of people. Ethnos. He says, I want, you to re- I want you to make disciples of all nations. I want you to basically go, make disciples, and then teach them everything that I've commanded you, and, and then go do that again. Just do that all throughout the world. So, so the Great Commission, essentially, you could boil it down like this. We are called by Jesus to live like missionaries in a culture that does not know God. That every one of us is called as a missionary. It's the Great Commission. What that means is that every person, I don't have to pray and say, God, is it your plan? Is it your will for my life to share who you are with somebody else. It's actually commanded of us. So what does it take to be a witness? Well, number one, it requires declaration and demonstration. That you and I have to speak verbally the gospel out loud. Some people say, hey, I, I want to preach at all times and sometimes I'll use words. And I'm like, you got to use words. You got to say things. You got to say the gospel, it has to be explained. You can't just live differently. But then there's plenty of people who are busy saying things, and then you watch how they live, and you're saying, wow, that's the most potent force for the devil. They talk about Jesus, but they live like the devil. Or at least they're tormenting me and how they function, if you know what I mean. Anybody met somebody, they talk about God all the time, and they make you not want to be anywhere near God. And, and this is what it is to be a witness. It, a witness is somebody who has heard and understood the good news to share, and, and then they're willing now to share the good news verbally and live the good news in our actions. So today I want to paint the picture for us of Christian witnesses who share Jesus with our neighbors in a way that's attractive. Because I really believe this, that if you and I do this in an attractive way, if we can get the and, that I can get the verbal declaration and the tangible demonstration, declaration and demonstration together, that you will become an irresistible force in your community. So in our reading this week, Exodus closes with God inhabiting the tabernacle. Up to this point, the Israelites have been traveling through the wilderness and and they've been following the pillar of cloud by day and fire by night. That God is tangibly around the people of Israel, but now Moses goes up on a mountain. He comes back down from the mountain. He has all of these instructions. And as you read through Exodus, you get laborious details about how long and how wide and how far, how everything's to be constructed constructed inside the tabernacle. And Moses goes back and he inspects to make sure everything is designed appropriately according to God's specifications, which always makes me chuckle because I hear People come to me and they say, Pastor Will, there should be no business in the church. There shouldn't be this man-made organization and, and all of these things. And you shouldn't be counting people. I'm like, have you heard? There's an entire book called Numbers. Have you seen the layout of the measurements of the temple? That, that God has designed this thing with order. Well, now Moses gets it all together. And at the end of Exodus, what happens is God's presence now inhabits the tabernacle. And this becomes for us today, as we look back at Old Testament things, this becomes the picture. Paul says that the Old Testament is a picture of a spiritual reality. That as God inhabits the tabernacle, actually that's God. He's desiring to inhabit our lives. When I was a kid, I would run through the church and this old lady would yell at me. And tell me not to run in the house of the Lord. And I'd look at her and I'd be like, lady, don't you know that I 
am the house of the Lord. God dwells in me. And I'm sure she probably couldn't stand me because I'm some punk pastor's kid, but I wasn't going to have it. This is just a room. When you look around the room that you're in, this room is not holy because it exists as a church building. It's holy because there's holy people in it, and whatever I touch is made holy because God dwells in me. So now in Leviticus, all of a sudden, you start, we start to get, we're 18 chapters we read this week of instructions for how to live in relationship with God who is now with us. So let me pull us back from this because you can get stuck in the details. But God is putting his stamp on these people. He's saying to the Israelites, I am going to make you into a nation. And I want you to follow me. We're going to go on this journey. And I'm not going to give you instructions for how to live in relationship with me. And not only are you going to be in relationship with me, you're going to be in relationship with each other. And then here's the interesting wrinkle. The way that you live with me and with each other is going to be different than the way that you live with the countries and nations around you. Leviticus chapter 18 verses 1 through 4 says it like this. The Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites and say to them, I'm the Lord your God. You must not do as they do in Egypt where you used to live, and you must not do as they do in the land of Canaan, where I'm bringing you. Do not follow their practices. God's saying, I want to create a nation that's separate and apart in the middle. You're going to be surrounded on the front side and the back side by these other cultures, but here's how you are going to be different. Verse 4 says, you must obey my laws. And be careful to follow my decrees. I am the Lord, your God. I'm your, I'm your God. I'm putting my stamp on you. Now I'm with you. I'm putting, I'm, my presence is in the tabernacle with you. So here's what this is. God wants us to be separate people. As you think about your life today, in the culture that you live in today, we, much like the Israelites, are surrounded by a culture that does not understand God. And God wants for every believer to know how to live in relationship with Him and in relationship with other believers. But He also wants us to do that in the context of unbelievers. That we would actually live our lives in a way that's different than the people around us. And, and, and the way I like to say that is that we are to live lives that are countercultural. Somebody turn to your neighbor and say, countercultural. God wants us to be different for our benefit and to lead other people to Him. We should be good witnesses. God gives us His law to show us how to live in His presence. And, and, and then how to live in the presence of all these other cultures. And, and he wants us to give a demonstration of that. Now that sounds a little bit straightforward, like, well, we should just live the way God's called us to live. And, and then why is this even a message, Pastor? But the American church has a very contorted or distorted way we do not share a unified vision for how to share Jesus. See, the problem can be traced back to 1925 in Dayton, Tennessee. There's a school teacher there named John Scopes who wound up in court because he was trying to teach evolution in public schools. We call it the Scopes Monkey Trial, and it's a, a watershed moment in the history of the American church. At issue was the control of curriculum in the public school system. John Scopes won that trial, and evolution was validated as a legitimate curriculum in the public schools. Now, the problem with that is in the Scopes Monkey trial, it had a huge and direct impact on American Christianity. What happens is that as a result of that verdict, 
a movement began to form called Christian subculture. Somebody turn to your neighbor, tell them, and shake your head and say, subculture. Oh, no. This is a problem. Because the church said, well, if you're going to teach evolution in the public school, then we're going to create our own schools. And what happened is that Christians began building their own schools, their own universities, their own publishing companies, their own music labels, and in the end, their own little world. So let's just give a, an example of what a Christian subculture might look like. Let's, let's take an example of how this might impact a person. We'll just call him Will. Will was born into a, a Christian home. I had Christian parents, or Will had Christian parents, and, and grew up in a Christian church. I attended a Christian college. And after college, Will started working on his master's degree at a Christian university. And then Will spent the rest of his life as a Christian leader in a Christian church. Now, in no way do I regret being born into a family centered around Jesus Christ. And I thank Jesus for it, and I hope to have my kids grow up in a Christian home. But I'll tell you what I'm in danger of. It's a danger to me. It's that I might spend my whole life living and breathing and ministering in my own little Christian world without ever really interacting or loving the world in which Jesus was born. So how do you live holy lives in our culture? Dr. James Hunter identifies three cultural strategies that Christians have tried over the years. And all of them are flawed. And it it's, it's, can be found in his, in his book, To Change the World, The Irony, Tragedy, and Possibility of Christianity in the Late Modern World. And, and I want you to write these down in your notes. On the back side of your note paper, I want you, to, want you to write these down. Number one is the tendency evangelicals want to dominate culture. Number two is that we would withdraw from culture. Or number three is that we would compromise with culture. So when we're trying to dominate culture, what happens is, is maybe it's another way of saying this is we're defensive against culture and we're seeking to dominate it. The way this is given most of its traction in the evangelical world today is that there's a, a brand of conservatism that is saying, hey, remember the good old days when we prayed in school, when we taught creation in school, when our kids would, would read the Bibles in school. And what the goal of that version of cultural, we're going to dominate culture, we're going to get power, we're going to legislate Christianity into our culture. Most now evangelicals have taken the second approach, which is to withdraw from culture. We're going to seek purity from culture, and we're going, to, we're going to withdraw from it entirely. Hey, I've had this conversation with my dad. Dad, give up the ghost. You're, you're not going to dominate culture through political activism. That, that Christianity can't be transferred through legislation. It has to be transferred through individual relationships with other people. That we're not going to see that done. I've had that conversation. So, but the problem is that evangelicals retreat from culture into subculture. That we've actually withdrawn our influence from the seven areas of, of cultural influence. And then the third one that is so common, I've watched it with my friends, maybe you're, you know somebody that is, maybe this is you, is that we compromise with culture. And we actually become assimilated by culture. In fact, it, this is accused of churches that are attempting to be relevant. Oh, you're, you're compromising with culture. And, and there's a quasi-theology de developed around the idea uh, that we should be subculture only, that we should not be in culture. But the, the compromise often comes from Christians that are seeking acceptance or friendship with other people in the world. 
So what should we do? What makes us different? God is on a mission field. He's on mission in the world. And he calls us to join him in his mission as missionaries. And I want you to hear this. The best missionaries establish faithful presence in culture. You can write that down. Number four, faithful presence in culture. We're not going to dominate culture. We're not going to withdraw from culture. We're not going to compromise with culture. We're going to establish faithful presence in culture. Under God's leading, we are called to live holy. We're called to live separate lives. We are to live and demonstrate something that is different than the culture around us. That we should not be the same as the, the cultures in Egypt or the cultures in Canaan, the culture here in America. But at the same time, we're to live our lives in the view of the nations and cultures around us. In Destroyer of the Gods, Larry Hurtado seeks to explain why the increasing number of people merged into Christianity in the Roman world. Christianity started out as 11 men, and then it, in, within a few short years, within a few hundred years, began to dominate Roman culture. And, and this is the case that it did this even though it was the most persecuted of all religions. And when you became a Christian, you earned a significant you paid a significant social cost. So he suggests that the answer to this was the Christian social project. There was a unique countercultural community found inside of Christianity that was attractive to the culture around it. And it stood, I believe, it, was, it stood out from the culture that time, and it stands out from our culture today. So the early Christian church was countercultural in five ways. And we don't have time to talk about them all today. We will actually talk about two of them today, and then we're going to talk about the other three in the following two weeks. But I'm going to give all five to you now. Number one, the early church was multi-ethnic. It's the first time religion began to encompass all peoples. Up until that point, Religion only encompassed culturally, it was culturally determined by where you were born. Number two, it's non-retaliatory. Christian culture, the early Christian church was committed to forgiveness. This was something that was absolutely unfathomable to the people of that time. Number three, the early Christian church was highly committed to the poor in the marginalized. That stood in stark contrast from the rest of the pagan world. Number four, the Christian church, the early church, was strongly and, and practically against abortion and infanticide. And then number five, the early Christian church revolutionized the sexual ethic. So we're going to talk about those in, in the next two weeks, but, but I want to camp out around just two uh, of those ideas today. And, and number one is that the, the early church was multi-ethnic. And I believe this, that every church, every, God's church is to all nations. And the Christian religious identity in, in, the, in the early church was shocking to the pagans. Because previously, you were born into your religion. And every person, every country, no matter where you were from, maybe if you, wherever you were born, that determined your religion. And for the first time, Christianity rose above a cultural identity and said that religion is more important than your culture. And this is, for the first time, a culture or a religion that went beyond one people group into all people groups. And so in our application of how are we different today, it means that every 
church, we ought to be fundamentally opposed to racism. That this is a standard idea that, that we should carry. We're fundamentally opposed to racism. And we're united in our effort to reach all peoples. That we are missionary focused. And on top of that, where every local gathering of believers is, that the, the dispersion of diversity inside of the local body should reflect that of the community at large. So by percentage, if, there's, if a community is 50% black and 50% white, the local church community should be a proportional representation of that multi-ethnic demonstration. All right. So, so then number two, very quickly, is that we are committed to forgiveness. And this is, this, the early Christians were notable in that if you attacked or killed them, they didn't organize retaliation or go get revenge, which is a novel concept even to us to this day. That when somebody messes with me, I'm not going to go get revenge. I'm not going to go retaliate. That would make me different than everybody I know. Non-retaliation. They were famous for experiencing death in execution. And, and as they were being executed, they were praying for the, the, the persecutors following the example of Stephen and Jesus himself. So this is, this is the example of us turning the other cheek, and it should be present. It's what makes us different culturally. It's what Larry Hurtado thinks is those two criteria. If we practice that, we become a multi-ethnic expression and that we are open to all people groups, that this will be something that is radically transformative in our context. So let me just give us very quickly as we wrap up, our approach to witnessing ought to be attractive. And so let me give you a couple ways that we're different culturally in our approach to witnessing. Western culture is ethnically divided and we're ideologically and politically divided. Our public discourse discourages the free exchange of ideas. In other words, when you go into a place, if you just, just check out social media and try to talk about religion and politics in a social media context, and just watch what happens. It's, there is a polarity there is a, that is found on social media that is absolutely at odds. And into that discourse, in this context, Christians have an opportunity to model civility and generosity in a culture, in a generation that desperately needs it. So don't load people down with number one, just like this is a basic framework for what it is to be a, an attractive witness. Don't load people down with a biblical mandate regarding your political persuasion. So I hear this plenty. It, you have to vote a certain way if you're a Christian. And, and all, what you've immediately done is alienate 50% of the population for something that is not biblical. You may interpret the word that way. You may see it and read it that way. But I'll tell you that it is an incomplete statement to believe that way. So rather, we got to demonstrate some Christ-like character traits in our conversations that are going to be different. It's going to set us apart from the culture around us. The first one is humility. You, this is an area that you can be faithfully present in culture and in a, just, in a generation that desperately needs it. When you're sharing your faith, do so with an attitude of humility. Humility includes recognizing the limits of what you can prove and understanding that everyone's position is based on un, an unprovable faith assumption 
about humanity and reality in some way. Every atheist that I know has based their assumptions in an unprovable, this is how the first cause occurred. Like if you trace everything back, everyone has to take a faith position. Christianity is that. Evolution is that. There there is a, a place where we just have to say, there's a limit to what I can prove. And you're going to have to talk to people who don't think like you. And there's little worse to ruin our witness than arrogant, know-it-all Christians. So, so live in a space of humility. Number two is patience. You can be faithfully present in culture by modeling patience in a generation that desperately needs it. When you share your faith, do so with an attitude of patience. Patience requires giving sustained time to listen and understand different experiences that divide us. Racial and ideological forgiveness in healing requires patience. It requires that, that we get into conversations and have awkward, difficult conversations that reach out past our perspective and our worldview. Number three is tolerance. Tolerance has been redefined, but when we're sharing our faith, we got to do it as Christians with an attitude of tolerance. It does not matter how the rest of the cultures behave. We are to behave with tolerance. Do not let someone hijack your concept of tolerance Let it be grounded in the Word of God. So here's what tolerance looks like according to Christian ethic. Tolerance shows respect for someone made in the image of God even when the person is espousing something morally reprehensible. If you believe that someone is doing something that is contrary to God's law and that is offensive to you, you would still show respect. It doesn't require, tolerance doesn't require accepting the views and behavior that are wrong, and nor does it require that you refrain from saying that it's wrong. But it does require that we give respect and human dignity to those that are made in the image of God. And then lastly, is a lack of self-righteousness. It is so important in our witness. I'll never forget, we had a lady who came to Two Rivers, She had been struggling with cigarette smoking for 17 years. We did our very first 21 days of prayer and fasting. She was delivered instantaneously from her desire to smoke. The very next week, she stood out in front of the church where all of these people who were coming, and they weren't Christians, and and she immediately told them, put out your cigarettes. That if you had faith, you wouldn't have to smoke anymore. And I had to pull her aside and say, didn't you struggle with cigarettes for 17 years and God just now healed you? Why don't you give them their 17 years? She took on an air of self-righteous. She had this indignation that somebody might do something that the week before she herself was doing. And in a world of injustice, we tend to despise those in power. And our self-righteousness is contrary to the gospel. And the gospel reminds us that we ourselves are unjust. We ourselves are sinners. And so the gospel keeps us from despising and abusing our oppressors. And at the same time, it keeps us from becoming oppressors ourselves as we seek to oppose oppression. We've got to be different. So what makes you and I different? We live carrying the presence of God. God dwells in us. And we become the tabernacle, the dwelling place of God. And as such, we've got to learn how to be holy and set apart and pleasing to God. Would your coworkers say that this is true of you? That you're holy and set apart? That you live in a different culture? We aren't called to dominate culture and get back what was lost in a culture war. We must be careful to not withdraw from culture and create a Christian subculture. And we certainly can't be assimilated by culture and become like the people around us. We've got to live as missionaries establishing faithful presence in culture. 
Our counterculture is marked by multi-ethnic inclusion and our commitment to forgiveness. We'll talk about the other three cultural distinctives over the next two weeks. But as we get prepared to respond, I want to ask you these few questions. What makes you different? Do you verbally share your faith with the people around you? Do your friends know that you live out your faith? Have you withdrawn into Christian subculture? And if, if so, what way could you re-engage? Let me pray for you. Jesus, I pray for every person that we could learn how to please you, that we could live in relationship with you and with other believers and with the world around us, that we'd be faithfully present in culture, that we'd be humble in our conversations, we'd be patient in our conversations. We wouldn't take on a cloak of self-righteousness, that every one of us could live in a way that is different than the world around us, and in so doing, become attractive to others. In Jesus' name, amen. What an amazing message from Pastor Will. We never like to close a service without giving you the opportunity to make Jesus the Lord of your life. For me, everything changed when I made this decision. So if that's you, you want to make Jesus the Lord of your life, then would you say this prayer with me? Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Repeat after me. Jesus, I come to you just as I am and confess my sins to you. I believe you died on the cross for me. I will no longer be bound by guilt or sin. I declare that your sacrifice on the cross has set me free. And I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I repent of my sins and trust in you alone as my hope of salvation. Through faith in your resurrection from the dead, I declare that I am a new creation. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. If you just said that prayer, we would love for you to fill out your response card so we can help you with your next steps. This is your church home now, and we cannot wait to see you next week.
Oh. 